Oh my God, it worked. <laughs> to some extent, Chief. Oh, there we go. Now it worked. There we go. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our uh, select board sponsored um, uh, budget forum and Q&A for folks uh, to come and ask questions about our annual budget. Um, I, in a minute, I will turn it over to Kate Hodges, our town administrator, who will give you a presentation many of you have seen details of uh, or a longer version of. Uh, and then we'll hear from some town department heads and then we'll turn it over to uh, residents to ask questions as they wish. Uh, and so we are grateful to everyone who has shown up, everyone who is watching through our partners at Sterling Lancaster Community Television. We thank them for, uh, for airing this. Uh, and uh, I just want to say that this has uh, been uh, an incredibly transparent process that I'm very, very proud of. When I ran for this office, I talked about radical transparency in, in, in all things. I think uh, Kate and Cheryl uh, and everyone who's worked with them on this, all of the department heads deserve uh, our thanks. Uh, the result is a budget that is not balanced, uh, but that is not uh, without trying. Uh, Kate will take you through all the factors that go into our annual town budget um, and how we got to where we are uh, and the importance of moving this budget forward. Um, and with that, um, and with a great sense of gratitude, I turn it over to uh, our town administrator. She loves it. This one? Yeah, that's the one you'll talk about. Hello? Oh, we have to turn it on. Oh, we have to turn it on. Hello? 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 Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Uh, so good evening. Um, I'm Kate Hodges and I serve as your town administrator and I want to thank everybody for taking time to come out this evening and participate in the process. Uh, I gave a longer, more detailed presentation at Monday's select board meeting and the folks at uh, Sterling Lancaster TV were kind enough to uh, clip it so they have it on their um, YouTube and we have it on our website. If, um, if you don't want to have to watch the whole select board meeting over again and, and just that budget part. Um, <clears throat> so the idea of this evening, as you heard from our chair, um, is for you all to really hear from um, someone else that isn't me, um, staff and, uh, and board, the board members and, and one another. So um, next slide, please. Uh, so by now, I am quite certain that the town's financial situation is well known. We have been collectively working on the budget since July of last year and throughout various meetings, <clears throat> both internally with the select board and the finance committee and school officials, uh, the total general fund deficit is between 1.1 and $1.2 million. We are recommending um, an override of 1.2 million. Um, that override question can only be answered by a ballot vote. The select board is, is the only way that that will get on the ballot is that they have to uh, vote that. And so we are meeting to close the warrant and discuss those articles uh, via Zoom at noon on Monday. And that's when they'll make the determination whether it is going on the ballot or not. Uh, the Finance Committee met to review the final numbers on Tuesday, March 21st, and they had an affirmative vote to recommend the budget as presented. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is a lot of information, so I am hopeful that po folks have been able to review the budget book and the executive summary, which are online. Um, but if you haven't, and you do go online, this is page 34 in that book and would be far easier to read, not on the screen. But here, <clears throat> the point of this is that our revenues and expenses are broken down into the larger line items, and they don't align. FY24 revenues are projected at about 26.1 million and personnel services equal 4.3 million and non-personnel services equals 2.2 million. The assessments from both Minuteman and Neshoba when all items are taken in together are about 18 million. <clears throat> and that leaves us with a projected deficit of about 1.1. Next slide, please. Neshoba's assessment um, amounts to each of the communities is based on a five-year rolling average. Um, the district's agreement states, quote, a member town will pay the same percentage as the town's foundation enrollment average for the preceding five years. 
The foundation enrollment is based on Massachusetts General Law Chapter 70, so it's very non-subjective. Lancaster's average of students in 2014 was 948, and our students in FY24 is projected to be 1,014. So said differently, Lancaster's five-year average enrollment percentage has increased by 0.26%, where Bolton's and Stowe's have both decreased. Next slide, please. Neshoba's administration has really been trying to work with us relative to our assessment amount. At the beginning of their budget cycle, it was projected that Lancaster's increase was going to hover above 7.5%. But through several iterations of their budget and several cost-saving measures, including not filling open FTE or full-time equivalent, both teaching and admin positions, the amount now stands at a three, uh, I'm sorry, at a four and three quarters percent increase from this year to next year. Our percentages are higher because our enrollments are higher. Next slide, please. For Minuteman, they've seen a jump in Lancaster students as well. The number from last year to this year has been 10 students difference. So at $31,000 per student, that's an increase in educational costs alone of $310,000. Next. <clears throat> Minuteman's assessment is based on a four-year rolling average, and that has increased about 5.5%. FY24's assessment hovers around 2.2 million or plus or minus 200,000 more than this year that we're in. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I've been asked, and certainly I believe it's still on folks' minds, what happens if the override doesn't pass? It's an important question. And while cuts would ultimately need to go across the board, both in schools and municipal services, Tonight, it's not appropriate for us to opine on what may be impacted from the school side. Right now, I can only share that at this time, the school department has said that to reduce Lancaster's assessment by $400,000, it would require a corresponding $1.3 million deduction in their budget overall district-wide. I've provided my thoughts and information at many meetings. Um, so this evening, I felt it best and talked it over with the board to turn it over to our uh, staff so that they can talk to you um, about their thoughts on the budget process. And with the question in mind, what does a $500,000 to $550,000 uh, de um, decrease in the municipal budget do for your operation in particular? Thank you. Kate, before you turn it over to the first director, I do want to uh, take a moment, and I, and I think I forgot, so if I didn't, then I'm thanking them twice. I want to thank the Finance Committee for their partnership. Dick Trussell is, is here representing the Finance Committee. Um, Dick, in particular, has been a numbers guru, um, I'm assuming his entire life, but at least uh, his entire time on the Finance Committee, and has been a, a great uh, advocate um, uh, and partner in pushing to get the numbers down and trying to get a good budget. Um, but I want to uh, I want to recognize that and thank Dick and the entire finance committee for their work. Who's up? So um, I did this presentation on. Oh. I did this presentation Monday, and I was asked to make it shorter, so I took off a thousand words. So this one won't be as bad. Uh, you might be surprised that the impact of cuts on the library would actually cost the town more money, and that seems counterintuitive. But I have a couple examples here that perhaps might interest you. So part of the library is certifying with the state. The town has to certify with the state that it's doing what it needs to do to fund a, an appropriate library. So if you can do that, and these thresholds are pretty reasonable, it's not like uh, you have to have a, a very large appropriation. The way the appropriation element works is it's the average of the last three year appropriations multiplied by two and a half percent. So the appropriation requirement trails the levy. So uh, to meet, th to meet our, our, our threshold there, it's not to get ahead of our expenses, it's just to maintain the level of expenses that we currently have. So we would lose $18,000 if we didn't certify with the state. So, so 
So that would mean that money we use to fill gaps in the budget. For instance, a lot of building maintenance comes out of state aid. We upgraded our security system. Keep going. Keep going. Great. And we also pay through professional development using that money. So none of that, those fund, thank you, none of those funds have anything to do with the appropriation. The other thing is, is we wouldn't be able to apply for grants. So in the last two years, we got $14,000 in grants that we applied for because we're certified. Uh, some of you might have been here long enough to remember when the library won a $3 million grant to expand the library and renovate it. That was because we were certified. Um, furthermore, this is also kind of counterintuitive. If the library can't remain open for at least 40 hours a week, we'll have to actually spend more money on books and media to the tune of about $12,000. So that has everything to do with the level of the thresholds we're meeting now, and if we go below that threshold, we have to spend more money on books and media if we want to certify in the future. So in short, the library would simultaneously get less and have to pay more just to be a certified library in the future, which wouldn't be sustainable. So we started with the budget, now let's go to services. Surprisingly for some folks is that local libraries are not obliged to lend to our residents. So what that means is if you look back to the override back in 2003, Lun Lunenburg, Lemonster, Bolton were not going to lend to Lancaster residents. A couple of residents spoke to me then that they didn't care if the override didn't pass because they would just use Lemonster's library. And when I told them that wasn't possible, they were starting to rethink what their choices were. I can't tell you they changed their mind, but that did pause people um, who were thinking they would just use another library. The same thing is true with holds. So we're part of uh, CWMR's networks, and for people who use the library and understand what holds are, that's our ability to get anything from any library in the Commonwealth. It's delivered to us for free and residents don't have to worry about what's on our shelves. They get whatever they want, wherever it is. Um, so last year we did that 13,000 times, and if we don't get the money we need to certify, the CW Mars line item might be the first one we cut after staff. Um, so other things you probably can anticipate is that our hours would decrease. Right now we're open all Saturdays in a year. And what we might have to do is only open summer, uh, uh, Saturday hours in the summer. So that's, a, that's two months and for the rest of the year we wouldn't be open on Saturdays. Um, evening hours would be also jeopardized. A lot of people were open a lot of evening hours and fewer evening hours would definitely uh, make it more difficult for people to uh, come to the library. And of course, if staff are laid off, one of the strengths of our library is there would be fewer events, activities, and programs. We have a summer series on the town green, a concert series, that would maybe go away because the money we use to pay for those events are not from the appropriation. You can't cut them and help us. They're gotten from grants, gifts, so that's a plus one on top of the appropriation. Um, one final thought may be worth bearing in mind. Lancaster may have the dubious distinction of failing to certify alongside the towns of Alfred, Monroe, New Ashford, and Savoy. I don't know any of those towns, but they're on the list every year that they don't even apply for certification. They're probably so off the mark that they don't even try. If residents choose not to pass the override and fail certifying the library with the Commonwealth, we may have the regrettable distinction of the t few towns lacking the determination and resolve to pass necessary overrides. And that basically comes, that, that's what we're talking about here, funding. And those libraries don't certify because they don't have enough funding. But that leaves 351 libraries that do. Thank you.
The Community Development and Planning Department works to aid residents, developers, and boards in navigating our zoning bylaws, Massachusetts general laws, and other integral plans for the town of Lancaster. Our office also obtains grants that aid in the appropriate development of Lancaster. Many grants we obtain help to ensure that we're meeting minimum state standards and requirements to maintain certain levels of funding available to Lancaster. This cut would impact our department drastically. It would lead to the elimination of full-time conservation agent, which would force the community to search for a conservation consultant. This will also result in longer wait times for application review, a delay in conservation approvals, and longer wait times to receive building permits as those require conservation review prior to approval. This would also result in a hefty conservation consultation fee for the town. We would also be forced to remove our administrative assistant position. This will result in a delay of information for residents and developers as we won't have resources as readily available to provide information and process requests. This will also result in a delay in permits for the Building Department, Planning Board, and Zoning Board of Appeals. Losing this integral support staff would have devastating impacts on our department on multiple levels and may deter necessary future growth in Lancaster. We will always strive to aid our residents to the best of our ability, but we need our staff to continue to serve our community at a level we can be proud of. Hello, my name is Amanda Cannon and I have been Lancaster's town clerk since January. The position of town clerk is one of the oldest offices established in colonial towns. It's a required position. The role of assistant town clerk, however, is not. A cut to services would mean the loss of an assistant town clerk and records officer. Due to the long list of responsibilities the town clerk's office is tasked with, including but not limited to recording, keeping, and preservation of vital records, the administration of fair and accurate elections, as mandated by federal and state statutes, as well as our town bylaws, recording the actions of the town's legis legislative branch, town meeting, creation of the required annual town report, um, administering voter registration and census reporting, dog licensing, ensuring all boards and committees abide by open meeting laws of the Commonwealth and proper posting, and that proper posting occurs for each meeting, issuing business and flammable certificates, and public records requests. Losing that role would most definitely hinder the ability to successfully complete these tasks in a timely and efficient manner and could leave us non-compliant with many of them required by federal or state law, certainly including the submission of bylaw amendments. With an ever increasing number of public records requests in recent months, as well as always changing and increasing requirements for running elections, it would be impossible to, to accomplish them on my own. 2024 will bring us four elections, a presidential primary in March, a local election in May, a September primary, and the November presidential. It will be election season the whole year, which truly could be a full-time job. Given the requirements we must fulfill to the state and federal government for accepting and processing mail-in applications, as well as early in-person voting, the preparation for an election begins weeks to months in advance of an election and continues on for weeks post-election. In closing, and on a more personal note, Lancaster has been my home for my whole life. Um, it's the place I grew up in, it's the place I chose to raise my children in. Five generations of my family have lived here, so seeing Lancaster thrive is near and dear to me. I'm humbled and proud of the team you see before you tonight, and I'm confident that every employee of this town is doing all they can to keep Lancaster moving forward. Progress is a marathon and doesn't happen overnight. But if we all work together, I'm confident Lancaster will come out on the other side of this, a more united and beautiful place for us to all call home. It's still on? It's still on, okay. <laughs> Thank you, I'm Mike Hand from the Fire Chief. I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to speak tonight about our budgets and how potential cuts would affect the fire department's operation and the residents of Lancaster. First, I'd like to mention that normally we don't start our budget process till about February. This year we started the process back in August, meeting as department heads with the town administrator, and we met often and presented budgets we needed to run our individual departments. 
Then we started to meet with her one-on-one -on -one and worked on making cuts. All of us as department heads have worked closely on a regular basis over the last seven to eight months to get to where we are today. So for the fire department, a $500 to $550,000 cut to municipal services would mean cutting the full-time full staff. Currently, we have two full-time firefighter EMTs plus myself during the day. We also use per diem people to cover shifts in the evening and on weekends to ensure we have a crew available and a quick response is guaranteed. The reduction in staff would meet an increase in response times. What this would cause is would be re reliant solely on the on-call members, which would mean if people are available in home, they would respond from their house to the station to get on a fire truck or the ambulance. Nationwide, there is a shortage of call volunteer firefighters and EMTs. The days of people living and working in town have gone. They all work in the cities and have family obligations. So we're looking at an average of a six minute response time with the staff in the station and up to 14 to 20 minutes with no one in the station. Last year, we averaged a six minutes response time for almost every incident. We had a couple incidents, one in particular where one person was on duty. It took 22 minutes for a response as he had to wait for a call member to come from their house. This is critical because in a cardiac event, six minutes is the average time that we need to get oxygen to a person and blood circulating to give that person the best chance of survival. For fires, it means it would spread more rapidly as fire spreads at a rate double, yeah, fire doubles in size every 30 to 60 seconds it's left unchecked. Yes, we have mutual aid agreements with our neighbor in towns. The key part of this is it's mutual, meaning it's reciprocal. It's meant to help us in a time of need, not to supplement the services. And most of these towns around us are in the same situation with staffing, in that the response time can almost double. You could be waiting 25 to 30 minutes for an ambulance, depending what the other towns have going on and which town is available to respond to us. Every department around us is seeing record call volume. In Lancaster, we went from 676 calls in 2013 to 1,266 calls in 2022. This is an 87% increase. There has been some mention about outsourcing the ambulance service. This was looked at a few years ago, and it came at a cost of about a million dollars just for EMS service. The entire budget for the fire EMS department is $750,000, and that's us provided 24-7 coverage for both fire and EMS. The ambulance bills out about $300,000 annually and has a 90% collection rate. That is revenue the town would lose. On top of this, we have annual testing and service that has to be done in accordance with NFPA and OSHA. This includes ladder testing, ladder truck certification, hose testing, pump testing, pump service, SCBA service, fit testing, the jaws of life service, and annual truck service. Our air compressor service and has to have air quality testing done on a quarterly basis. If some of these are not done, that are required by OSHA, fines could be issued for non-compliance. This also goes to impact our ISO rating. ISO is the insurance service office. They audit the fire department and give us a score. This score is based on a 100-point system and is broken down into sections. Emergency communication is 10 points. Personnel, capabilities, training, and equipment is 50 points. Water supply is 40 points. They then issue a PPC, which is a public protection classification. We are currently at a 5-5X. When they come in and do the audit, they look at all our records, our response times, if we're properly staffing the equipment, if we're responding with the right amount of equipment, and if we're maintaining all of our training. Um, if we do not meet or maintain the current classification, the town's insurance rating would be affected, meaning your homeowner's insurance would go up. I can't tell you exactly how much it would go up, as the insurance companies would be notified by ISO that the rating has changed. The individual insurance companies would then reach out to you and determine how much it would go up. I would guess that would be in the hundreds of dollars range. Um, so we as a department work hard to maintain all these records and testing to ensure we maintain our current rating. Uh, we, un we understand this is a difficult time for everyone. We appreciate your time and listen to all the work that we've been doing to try to help you. Thank you.
Good evening, everybody. Kevin Bartlett, DPW Superintendent. Um, I've been superintendent for eight years, um, employed with the town for almost 20. Um, so presently we have three members in the highway division who maintain 80 miles of roadway, stormwater systems, a fleet of 12 plus vehicles and machines, and small hand uh, equipment. In the cemetery division, we have two members who maintain the mowing, weed whacking of six cemeteries, six parks, all tree-related calls, as well as equipment including weed whackers, mowers, chainsaws, leaf blowers, three trucks, and a tractor. First and foremost, the DPW's primary concern is public safety. We prioritize road conditions during the winter months, which include snow removal, treatment of roadways, utilizing a rock salt sand mix, which salt has increased substantially in the last two years. We rely on rock salt to assist with snow removal and road treatment 80% of the time during snowstorms. With a budget cut, we would have to cut back usage, which would jeopardize the safety of roadways. We have always had some of the best kept roadways during snowstorms. Additionally, snow plow and equipment repair is crucial for maintaining roads. If we do not have the funds to repair equipment, we would have no means to clear roadways. Parts for equipment has risen 30 to 40 percent over the past two years. Budget reduction could also pose restraint on our seasonal employees for snow removal of which we greatly rely on. A team of eight is not enough to properly clear 80 miles of roadway during a snowstorm. Road repair and maintenance would take a hit from budget reduction in terms of keeping up with pothole repair, cross trench, berm, stormwater maintenance, repair of catch basins and outfalls, as well as residents' requests for assistance. Since we are no longer able to utilize Chapter 90 funds for roadway and crosswalk line painting, this would suffer from budget cuts as well. Typically, we paint white fog lines, yellow center lines, crosswalks, stop bars once a year, usually in the spring. This is approximately $42,000 a year. That was last year's price. Most likely that will rise. Tree removal is another critical job of the DPW. A budget cut would mean reduced tree removal along roadways that pose a safety concern to residents' property and people walking along sidewalks, as well as potential roadway blockage if they should fall into the road. For the cemeteries, fallen trees and branches could damage headstones, many of which are historic. The cemetery division is mowing six cemeteries, six parks, including baseball fields, the town green and other fields with very worn equipment that require constant repair. The parts to repair the equipment has also risen 30 to 40 percent over the past two years. With a budget cut, we may not be able to fix a mower or other equipment if it does break down. With the past budget cuts we have endured in the past years, the DPW has suffered greatly. We are still trying to recover from these budget cuts on top of substantial price increases of everything overall, and we cannot keep up with our budget. With another budget cut, this would put us back another two to three years. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Kelly Dolan. I have the honor of being the Director of Health and Human Services for the town. My role here, along with my team, who's in the back, is to coordinate all townwide social services, public health and recreational programs for our residents and our visitors. Our team is committed to building a better Lancaster by positively impacting the people, coordinating with our departments and boards to implement policy and providing the well-being of our residents every single day. Since this is a new department, I think it's imperative to highlight a few data points since October of last year. We've had 98 new members join our center and over 5,000 sign-ins where people are able to engage in one of our many events and or just socialize with their friend over a cup of coffee. 
We have added nearly 30 programs and have serviced over 400 outreach requests. These services come in the form of medical needs, mental health services, food insecurities, and much more. Recreation has added 18 new programs for our youth and their families, which keep them in Lancaster and not having to travel to our neighboring towns for programming. We have also rented our beautiful facility out over 20 times for special events, birthday parties, and such. All this said, I'd like to share that growing up, my mother always told me that being in a community does not hold the same meaning as being part of a community. Being in one is your physical presence, while being part of one means having the ability to meet, interact, and build relationships with other folks. It is said that the health of a community depends on the strength of those of the intention, I'm sorry, of the interactions without a department such as this one, which is only six months in its infancy, we would risk losing the strength this community has grown to have. We thank you very much. I'm gonna to try to do it with that down there. Can everyone hear me? Right, but I, it's on, it's just in front. I'm hoping that it's loud enough. If not, louder, Steve? <laughs> Over the last nine months in speaking with residents, staff, and board members alike, it is painfully evident that no one is taking the town's current fiscal outlook lightly. I am confident that I speak for all departments when I tell you, as staff, we will remain resolute in providing the best possible service in the most financially responsible manner. We actively search for grants, we use proven best practices for staffing and equipment replacement. We are financially responsible in our everyday operations. And many of us are working with budgets far less than our neighbors, and we take pride in offering the same level of service, and I would like to think even better. Regardless of what happens with the upcoming budget, we want the residents of Lancaster to be confident in knowing your departments will continue to be creative and transformational to meet the needs of Lancaster, and each of us are committed to doing all we can with what we have with the goal of increasing the quality of life for our residents. In 2003, Lancaster was faced with an override, much like this one. As a young police officer, my position was one of many in town that might have been lost if the override had not passed. I remember the stress it added to all our lives, both staff and resident. I remember how it affected the interactions with the community. Some were positive with pledges of financial support and optimism, and others apologetic in tone. It felt like residents were being forced to decide on the quality of life for their families over the impact of increased taxes. I remember the regret in hearing the disappointing tone by someone wanting to support its town, but unable to see how they could afford to do so. It was one of the many life-changing moments for me over my career. When the vote passed, it was my belief then, as it is now, that our community chose to make an investment in its staff, in our services, but most of all, in itself. I can tell you that your vote mattered in 2003. The override inspired me, and staff like me to dedicate a lifetime to Lancaster. I say this wholeheartedly. An appreciative employee will always do more than is expected. They will raise the level of service beyond what is necessary. They will always remember how lucky they are to have your support. As Lancaster finds itself with an opportunity to make an investment, it is my hope that we will once again choose to invest in one another and our future. I would like to say that I do not believe any department to be more important than the other. Over the past year, staff has spent hours meeting together, learning from one another. Collectively, we have a better understanding for the services our departments provide to our Lancaster residents. Each service is of equal value if not to you, perhaps to your neighbor. Currently, the police department is working on grant projects with the DPW, Health and Human Services, Fire, Planning and Development Departments. These partnerships yield results not possible, working alone. And I only bring this up because one of the services that would suffer with cuts is our grant writing ability. Currently, Lancaster has six sergeants, I'm sorry, three sergeants, six patrol, one detective, and myself. As a team, we provide 24-7 proactive preventative crime patrol. Our response services are safe, efficient, and effective using proven best practices with our current staffing. 
As a community, Lancaster is larger in population and in size than Bolton, Berlin, and Harvard, yet your police budget is lower. Lancaster does it for less. But unfortunately, we are at the point where any cuts to our budget would cost staff and services. Last year, public safety officers responded to over 13,000 calls for service. Some calls were quick, required little to no follow-up. Others might require week-long investigations. But roughly 20% of those calls require two or more officers to be dispatched. This is based on industry standards, accredited policies, and proven practices. There is no way around it. Making cuts to staff will ultimately put officers and residents at greater risk. We will create longer response times, less than adequate numbers of personnel responding to properly de-escalate and simultaneously investigate calls for service. Even motor vehicle accidents will become problematic with only one officer response. Although no one can predict what will happen if we lay off officers, studies suggest and recent history has proven that sudden reductions in the size of a police force can generate increases in crime. The termination of police officers requires the remaining officers do more with less. Officers become reactionary by necessity, and preventative crime patrol and, and protection initiatives are some of the first to be suspended. Community policing efforts suffer. Invest investigations will not get the time necessary and attention that they deserve. Traffic enforcement becomes all but non-existent. Grant writing suffers as officers struggle to keep up with the calls for service and the reports that follow. And with only mandatory training standards practiced, our officers will fall behind any advancements in our profession. I have heard residents talk about mutual aid as a solution to staffing shortages. And I can tell you in speaking with our neighboring chiefs, they are feeling the same financial effects. They are also experiencing budget cuts. They do not have extra staff waiting to help us when needed. Any help offered will be based on their availability and not our residents' emergency. Mutual aid is an agreement to mutually help one another with the payment for services to be based on a reciprocal service. Once Lancaster fails to be able to meet the requirement for the agreement, departments will stop sending officers. It would not be fair for us to expect other towns to fund Lancaster's emergency response. It's very hard for me, as I'm sure you can tell, as a town resident and someone whose family's been involved in public safety for decades to have to deliver this message. And I admit, I do not have all the answers, but I am willing to speak to anyone who has suggestions recommendations or options that will help Lancaster. What I do know is that Lancaster is at a crossroad. One way or another, we will be defined by what happens with this vote. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Department Heads. Um, thank you, Kate, uh, for that presentation. Um, at this point, I think I'm going to stop getting blinded by the overhead projector. Maybe. Sorry. There you go. It's not the way you're supposed to do it. <laughs> Uh, so at this point, we, and is there a microphone for folks to ask questions, or they have to use the handheld there? Oh, I, we can pass it. We can, yeah, we can fill Donahue that. I think most people know what that means. Okay. Um, Kelly's going to play Phil Donahue. If you have a question, um, raise your hand, and I'll call on you in the order I can see you. If you don't have a question, keep your hands down, I suppose. Yes, sir. Kelly, can you? <clears throat> Uh, well, we, is fairly yeah, we, yeah. we need your name and your address. I'm file 140 Deer Shore Road. Okay. My, I understand the tax rate right now to be about $17.18. Yes. What does the tax rate go to if the override passes? Very good question. What's your name again, I'm sorry? Never file. Never file. Oh. Okay. Um, One more time? You're a newcomer. Yeah. Welcome to Lancaster. <laughs> My family's a newcomer. We moved here. 52 years ago this month. So uh, it makes us. Oh, okay. They're getting you that answer, sir. It's a very good question, but they have the answer. Well, I guess. And I do know, so we, we've seen recently a reduction in our rate because we paid off the school um, that, that was at 19 
1945 or 1994 uh, per thousand. Then we paid off the school, which shaved off about 60 cents. Um, and then we um, we did have revaluations, but our rate had dropped because of the tax levy. It had dropped down to 1718 because it's based on the taxable property in town uh, and a rate. And I think I'm giving you roughly the <laughs> roughly accurate stuff while I'm vamping while they while they come up with the answer. Um, and that's why it dropped more than the 60 cents. But folks, bills went up, I think, on average, about $249 for your average home because of those revaluations. So where the rate went down, the value of your home went up, which is great if you're going to sell it, I suppose. But if you're not going to sell it, it's not great. Uh, and your tax bill, on average, went up just because of that. So we are getting to that right now. Hold on. Dick, do you know the number? We'll be right back at you. <laughs> Nick Win Clark has got a question. We're going to come right back to you. No, I have a question, but maybe I can answer it. Is the slide that showed that you guys provided as accurate and the tax rate was about the $18. $18.13? That's it's, we thought it was eighteen ten. So. Oh, that, wow, they were trying to clarify it to the penny. It's eighteen thirteen. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Wynn. And thank you both for your attempt at accuracy. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, it does take a village. Whoever said that about the community? Being in the community, Win Clark there for the save. Any other? Any other? Any other questions? Yes. Just state your name and address. Uh, Rebecca Young Jones, 94 Barnes Court. Um, I have probably two questions. Uh, so, if the bond is passed for the school. That's a September vote, correct? Um, we don't have a date set, but roughly that time, yeah. September and December. that is yeah. It's between a September and December. Same amount. We don't know that. So the, the, that is the authorization to move forward. Yeah. We're not borrowing at that time. So there's steps to that, right? So we so when we would the be, borrowing take place? <clears throat> well, it, it's a, probably two, yeah, 2025. Yeah. So just to clarify for folks at home, um, Rebecca, just to, there is um, need and w there's a process underway for a new high school at Neshoba for those who aren't following this. Um, the estimated impact of the town if that project goes forward could be around $40 million thereabouts. Yeah. The process requires um, a vote um, by the three towns at town meeting in between September and December. The committee will come to us um, with uh, a framework and timeline, and we'll, we'll schedule that. Uh, then the process begins if we authorize the bond, right? And then they go about. And then we would borrow, but you won't pay anything on it until 26. And depending on how long the project goes, if it goes over a fiscal year, you won't pay the full amount until 27. Um, the other thing I noticed in your presentation on Monday night was that salaries are going up 3.5 to 4 percent. Um, now, I understand everybody is dealing with inflation and other rising costs in their lives, but why was the salaries not capped at 2 The salaries are capped at 2 percent. <coughs> but okay. raises are going up. Well, that was the aggregate data based on... Does that take union stuff into account? Oh, I'm just trying to understand. Yes. Yes, yes it does. So not unclassified, meaning non-union workers, are capped at 2%. Okay. We have not settled the contracts, and the school has not settled the contracts with the teachers' union, so we have to carry a little more. But at least on the town side, we've been very clear that we try to have the unions match the non-unions in just in the interest of fairness. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good question. Denise, name and address. Denise Hurley, 102 Boca Road. Uh, no questions, just um, some thoughts that I have about the override. Um, I know that it's uh, scary numbers and it's uh, something that probably will be difficult for the residents of our town. However, I think to keep the vitality of our town and the great services that we are now um, getting 
from our town. I think it's really important to think about you know, um, what the override will do for, to keep our town the way it is. I'm happy with it. I love the way things have been going in this town. I love, I love the growth. I like the, the community feel that I have now. So I'm just hoping that, you know, I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot of money. But I also know that Get what you pay for, and if, if we do the override, we'll still keep our town the way it is right now. And with all the great stuff happening throughout, and I just think that's very important to consider. Um, and uh, that's all I gotta say. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Any other questions? Sherry. Although I'm cheating by giving away people's first names. So. You still have to give your full name and address. Sherry Cutler, 67 Harvard Road. I just have a quick question, um, and I don't know if we still do this as a town. If the tax, if this passes, and the taxes go up, we have a lot of people on fixed incomes. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they're going to be affected by this. Are we going to bring back a work program? I know we had, like, I remember them mowing the lawns, and they were out there just doing anything they could to help towards this increase. Are we going to bring that back to help them? Because I think. <coughs> Yeah. So, first of all, we still have it. Uh, we still have it. Second of all, what you'll see at the town meeting, uh, the select board is asking, uh, well, if we approve the warrant on Monday, but um, is asking for an article to be added to create a tax fairness committee, um, which is the first step we're going to have toward creating a senior means testing for our tax system that will allow seniors of limited income to submit um, paperwork to prove their income level and allow us to reduce their tax burden um, from them. So in addition to the work program, because there's only a certain amount of dollars and sometimes that just doesn't do it from a reduction, the senior means uh, tax thing, which will take a couple years to come into play, but this uh, tax fairness committee will be step one. That will allow us to reduce the burden on seniors as well. It will, it would be luckily, likely in time before the school before the school burden. Will the, will the senior means test be in place to have enough of an impact? It will take a few years to come into effect, um, so it won't be necessary for the increase that comes with this override, but it would be in place roughly around before the school. Right, so what happens is it, a vote at town meeting, the tax fairness committee can come back at any time. It doesn't have to wait until annual town meeting, although they have to do their work. And then, depending on what's going on, you then petition to the legislature for, a, in our case, it would be a code. So we would have a code. And then they send the code back, the legislature saying, okay, and then it goes on the election. And then as soon as that's submitted, providing it passes on a ballot, that's what you, that's what you could do. And there's many different ways to fund it. Um, one of them, which I think might be advantageous, is if we do see some additional growth and development to take any of those permit monies or any of those additional tax monies that are coming in and earmark an amount so that we start by funding this fund and then it's it's utilized to decrease the burden on you know those who who fit the criteria the other thing it helps is it will enable the social worker to be able to access state circuit breaker funds and that is something that we haven't um, been able to do at least from what I can tell um, yet. And so um, I think it's, it's just another program, but it, it's up to $1,000 that's coming from the state that further reduces uh, persons over age 65 who meet the, the thresholds. But I appreciate you asking that, because it's important to note, we understand there's gonna be an impact on folks. Um, and some folks it's very, you know, it's, it's a difficult impact to have. So we are working on ways to mitigate that the best way possible. Yes. Kelly's regretting she sat so close to the microphone. Ralph Gifford, 861 George Hill Road. Kelly said something earlier that I really appreciated, and that is the importance of relationship in building community. That is vital. And I want to bring to your consideration a different way of looking at that, and that is the cost of conflict. 
Now, that might be a difficult concept to understand initially, but if I ask you what's the cost of conflict in Ukraine right now, it's in the billions of dollars. So clearly, conflict can cost a lot of money. Now, if I bring that a little more personal, and I talk about the conflict, the cost of conflict in a family that undergoes divorce, now that gets personal, but that cost is high. It costs families a lot when they undergo divorce. So, now let's ask, what's the cost of conflict in town? Well, one of the areas where we see this cost rising is the cost of our litigation cost is ballooning. It's now, if I recall correctly, over $200,000. It's been skyrocketing, really. But cost of conflict shows up in other ways. We have had a lot of division in town. That ultimately creates less cooperation. People want to be less involved in town. We have opportunities for more people to be involved in volunteering. There's a lot of remote workers. But who wants to volunteer and get involved when there's so much bitterness and so much anger? I don't want to be subjected to that. I appreciate we're just... You have a budget-related question. I, okay. I do. Got it. Okay, good. All right. Got it. I do. So this affects budget when people get into their camps and they begin to say, I want to get my piece to hell with everybody else. That's a cost of conflict that affects our budget. So my question is, how can we reduce the cost of conflict? How can we do, as Kelly suggested, strengthen our relationships and build community. Thank you. Thank you. you want to answer that? I think it was a rhetorical question. Uh, yeah. David Millett, uh, 2748 North Main Street. Um, at, on Monday's uh, meeting, hey, you mentioned uh, about what might happen to the town farm grading and what that might cost each individual household on average uh, if the interest rate were to go up because this override doesn't pass. Do you think you could go into that a little bit? Because it sounded very much to me like if the override didn't pass, everybody was going to get about the same level of a bill once the high school was approved. And it seems also true that the town doesn't have complete control over whether or not the high school gets approved because the process includes two other towns that are very likely to approve it. And then uh, we'll have a vote with all three towns. I know that they make this great thing and they make spreadsheets, but I still, <laughs> I still do it out by hand. So if you'll, um, so what I was saying is, uh, at about a hundred and twenty million dollar building that has Lancaster's liability, give or take around forty million, and so thinking that we uh, might go for a thirty-year bond, which is pretty typical, we right now have a. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. Yes. Sorry. Um, we right now have a. Oh, it's clearer with this, even though. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's a microphone. No, no, no. I mean, it's not just louder. It's oh, like, yeah, it's yeah. Less, it's yeah. less echoey. Sorry. So, um, so for 30 years, uh, we have a AAA3 bond rating currently. And so the rate um, right now would be about 5.57, which, to be honest with you, is not a really great rate. I mean, it's still, you know, a little over 5.5%. That equates to 468 to $487 a year. And... That is for the average single family home. Um, I bumped it up just uh, averaging at 480, figuring by the time we go through this, home prices or home valuations might be up. So with a AA bond rating, we, it actually jumps considerably to almost 8%, um, and in some cases, more than 8%. So 
that rating um, brings us to somewhere in the neighborhood of 736 to 812 per year um, on top of that. And again, that's a 30 year, and these are, these are very basic numbers, but the idea is that protecting our bond rating uh, well, well painful, um, ends up not costing as much money in the long run should the school come about. And one of the other things I did mention at, at the meeting is that it is, it's very likely that um, one town may decide that they don't want to move forward with it, but because we're a regional district, there's a second bite at the apple, and essentially what they do is the school department pays for a special election. And then it doesn't, it goes by one person versus one person, meaning everybody that is eligible to vote in all three communities will cast their ballot. And so it could be that there's quite a few people from whatever community voted no that say no, but that the, the yes is far outweigh. So I think that it's, it's really prudent for us to make sure that we have that long-term plan because even a vote no isn't necessarily a no. You know? You know? Any other questions? Uh, ask my board members, do you have any other questions? Do you have any questions, comments? I mean, questions we've been talking about this since August, but um, do you have any? Dave has one more question. So, so far, this has all uh, been at 2748 North Main Street. Thank you. So, so far this has all been about the override. And again, um, my question also talked about our own self-control, which we may not have with the vote over the school, but if we vote this override, um, you mentioned something about down the road, as the taxes came in from North Lancaster and uh, Fort Pond Road, that we would be very likely to be able to project an underwrite and have control so that these costs will only be temporary if we say yes to the override. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck with 30 years at 8 or 8 plus percent on a 30 year bond. And, you know, I would say we, as a town, people will regret that. But you, you've brought up the favorite topic of Dick Trussell, which is um, the underwrite. <laughs> Um, you, you want to give that back to Kate? Yeah. Can you can you illuminate us about that underwrite? Yeah. Do you want? Me? I just like to give credit where credits to Dick. Also talks about that underwrite all the time. That's what the, the finance committee last night. Asked yes. That in Indeed. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think it's important to just take that from a little bit of a personal standpoint because I realize that for most people when they hear that they think, yeah, right. Nobody ever, you know, nobody ever gets money back. You're never going to give our taxes back, etc. I know. I believe me. And honestly, but but so that's the point, right? Is that you have I mean, you have staff, but you also have finance committee and select board who are committed to seeing that through. So if you know, I win the lottery or get hit by a bus or both and I'm not here anymore, the idea is that people will remember this conversation and that should be part of the planning. So when Cheryl and I did a very uh, perfunctory build out of what that would look like, again, it, it hinges on what we were told was going to be built, being built, in a reasonable amount of time. It would, it would seem that if all things go according to plans, that in fiscal year 28 yep. and fiscal year 29, because my thought at least now would be to split it over two years instead of one major drop, those would be underrides. And an underride is effective, it's the same, it's actually a ballot question. So we basically, instead of taxing at the two and a half, you tax under that. Maybe it's one, maybe it's zero. So it isn't, um, people are thinking like it would be this giant windfall that there's a thousand dollars back or something. I, you know, you can't predict that. But I know as long as I'm here, I'm, I'm committed to seeing that through. And, you know, I know that the board is committed to holding us to that. And I would imagine anybody else that shares those seats would do the same. Yes, we will. 
Yes. You sure can. Uh, name and address, please. Uh, Leslie Allison, uh, 343 Brockman Road. Um, I'm sure we all agree no one wants to be spending more money, um, but I think the message I'm receiving in this whole process is that in the short term, this might be costing us more money, but in the long term, it actually will not be. At least we're hoping that's the case. That's what the, the facts are bearing out right now. I would like to make a request to the citizens of this town who can pay attention to this that's going on and understand what's happening here, that we try to share the information in a truthful and fact-based manner. Because there's a lot of people in town that are sharing rumors that are not true. It's not helpful in this process. We have people that have been working on this for months, months and months. So please, let's, let's share this information truthfully. And if anyone has any questions or contentions, please talk to the experts, not those that are spreading rumors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to make a, a comment. I, I was going to say name and address. I'm kidding. No, sorry. <laughs> so something that was talked about earlier, I want to make sure I reiterate. Uh, the, the department has been working with Kate for months, and the budget that was put forth included how much capital? Zero. Zero. So the budget that we're talking about trying to figure out how to meet with cuts is already an absolute minimum budget. There is no, what is the political term? Fat or pork or, I don't know what that is. Pork? No, that's a politically correct term, but they call it pork, yeah. They do call it no pork. pork. <laughs> fluff. Fluff. There's fluff. fluff. There we go. There's, There's no, no there's only one budget. strip of bacon. <laughs> so, so this is this is for minimum minimum service. There is no additional investment in capital. There is no investment in any of our infrastructure. Nothing. This is to get back to an absolute minimum. So I don't want anyone in town to believe that you know this big fluff budget was yeah. put forth <laughs> months months. And I think as as Chief Hansen stated uh, in the past, this has been um, started maybe in February. And this, you know, Kate saw this coming, and I, I think I'm just, I'm really grateful, personally, for the effort that she's putting into the town. I hope every resident feels that also. Uh, but I uh, just want to make sure everyone doesn't think that this was a, you know, a big expanded budget that we're trying to meet. Thank you. Yep. Do you have any comment you want to make before I? No. You don't have to. You don't have to if you don't want to. No, no pressure. <laughs> Steve wanted me to make sure Alexandra Turner, Main Street. Yeah, what number Main Street? <laughs> 620 Main Street. Um, so, no, I wanted to thank everybody that came, the department heads and Kate and Cheryl for a very thorough process. Um, I was one of those people back in 2003 that ever talked about and referred to that worked very, very hard to pass an override. And by the way, we also passed an underride. Woohoo! <laughs> it can be done. Uh, it can be done. In fact, it may have passed by a slight margin, a slight edge over the override. Surprise, surprise. Um, but that, even that was controversial because the discussion was, do we need, the, you know, should we be giving this back in the time when you know costs are accelerating? So, um, so we've been through this and it really took it took a lot, it took everybody coming together to try to do this. I have more questions that I'm gonna be working on with Kate and Steve, and they'll come up at Selectman's meetings. Um, you probably all have questions too, and as Leslie referred to, you know, bring them back to, bring them back to us. And don't be shy about asking the questions, because I think we got out a lot, a lot of really great information right now. But what I find more often than not is people don't ask questions and then they vote either out of ignorance or without asking things. And um, honestly, I just want people to vote informed. So, so, so please just bring that forward. And I will continue to try to ask questions, bring them to any of us, and we will, uh, and we will forward those questions as well and ask them for you. Thank you. Oh. Need to. There you go. Um, uh, I will uh, echo the gratitude and thanks that I began the meeting with, um, and uh, add a, one qu quick question. I'd, I'd like to ask this of Cheryl, so I'm sure she knows this is coming. Um, if so, folks, the, all these department heads laid out for you 
um, frankly, the really dire circumstance we'd be in as a community if, if cuts needed to be made. Um, even if we were, what did what, frankly, a bunch of boards have done in the past decades and use free cash and stabilization money, which should not be used because they're at all time lows, um, uh, we would be in a position where our services would be cut to crazy draconian levels, we'd have no savings, uh, and that will have fixed almost nothing. Because next year we will face an override of conservatively 1.6 million. So if we if we do every slashing humanly possible and decimate departments and the benefits that the town gets from those, um, it doesn't solve anything for next year. Uh, and so the time to act now, the time to act is now to get ahead of these issues, um, uh, pass this override, move the budget, move the budget forward allow the town to continue to operate as it has, allow um, the revenues to come in from, from the uh, diversification of our tax base, uh, and allow us to continue to provide the great community that Kelly talked about and the great investment that Chief uh, Moody talked about. This is an investment in our future. Uh, it's an investment in our families, in our parents, in our grandparents, in our neighbors, in our 80 miles road, uh, in everything that these good people and the people they represent uh, do for us and with us each and every day. So um, I hope you join us in supporting that investment. Um, come to the town meeting on May 3rd uh, at the Mary Rowlandson Elementary School and perhaps also Luther Burbank, depending on how many of you show up. Uh, and then come to the ballot box on May 8th um, in this very room uh, from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, because uh, once again, decisions are made by people who show up. Now you just ended my very dramatic close, Sherry, by raising your hand. On a log. One more time? Majority. It's a majority. Yes. Very good question, though. The vote will require a majority. All right. Simple majority. Thank you. There are several types of majorities. Simple majority. And then it goes to the ballot if we put it on. Right. If the, if the budget is passed as it is being recommended by the Select Board and the Finance Committee, it is the budget you've just heard discussed this evening, which is out of balance, which then will require a vote five days later by the townspeople to override Proposition 2 and a half. Yes? It's online. Uh, just on the town website. So ci.lancasterma.gov. Yeah. Or .net. Thank you. All right. Um, with that, is there a motion to adjourn this special budget forum? So moved. Whatever. We I gaveled it, and we can gavel it out. Okay. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks.